Yeah, please have your seat, then maybe you can do it once. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great honor to have Professor Arad Gatra from Kansas State University as our colloquial. Career uh, and has uh, uh, obtained many honors and awards, and I will not, you know, delay his talk further by mentioning many of those. Uh, just to mention that he has got the uh, NSF Career Award. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Physical Society as well as the American Astronomical Society. And I'll just say one more thing, which is uh, Professor Astra, uh, along with Jim Peebles, who got the Nobel Prize. Uh, in uh, 2019, Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, they uh, uh, wrote the first uh, dynamical dark energy model in 1988. And I'm uh, very glad to see that he will talk about some of those uh, and even uh, obviously more modern, uh, more up to date uh, work re related to uh, similar things today. So without further delay, uh, yeah, sir, can you have a little question? Unmute yourself uh, because you, you are unmuted. Yes, so. Okay. But thank you very much for that really kind introduction. I'm sorry I'm late. Um, so, is most of the audience mostly graduate students, master's students? Yeah. Okay, so then I'll go a little bit faster in the introduction. So before I start, I just want to point out this website, and it's got some really nice videos um, that describe um, global warming in a very clear way, and it's a really useful thing to look at if you're not familiar with global warming. So I, I'm, I'm a cosmologist, um, so I'm interested in structure on very, very large scales in the universe and how it evolves in time. And this is a really exciting time to be working in cosmology. I mean, all of you are familiar with um, all these great telescopes, for example, James Webb, and that's just one example. And they're getting a lot of really nice data that's reinforcing two very striking results. So the first one is that when we look at the energy budget of the universe at the present time, we don't understand 95% of the contribution to that energy budget, um, and that we divide up into two parts. One's called dark matter, the other's called dark energy. The 5% we understand is um, the baryons, the atoms and molecules. So it's a really nice time because 95% of the stuff out there is unknown, and so if you're interested in trying to figure that out, you have a lot of things to look at. The other result that's getting reinforced by these cosmological observations is probably going to prove to be even more profound if it holds up. And that's um, the suggestion that either quantum mechanics or relativity or both are incomplete and need to be improved upon. And if that holds up, that'll be really striking because quantum mechanics and relativity have been the two foundational pillars of physics for over a century now. So, um, let me move on to this. So I'll start out with a really quick summary of the energy budget now. So when we look out there, we can see that 5% um, of the stuff is what um, cosmologists call baryonic matter, that's atoms and molecules. And this number started getting put in place through the work of um, Gamow and his graduate student Alpha and his postdoc Herman when they were trying to explain the light element abundances. And um, they realized there'd be photons left over. And through a very inspired guess, um, they figured out these photons would be in the microwave part of the back spectrum. And those photons were discovered by Penzias and Wilson in the 1960s. And that was interpreted by this companion paper of Vicky Peebles' role in Wilkinson. So even before that, um, Zwicky um, was looking at clusters of galaxies and getting the velocities of these galaxies. And then he assumed those velocities were caused by gravitational forces. And then he tried to figure out how much mass he would need to produce those gravitational fields. And he realized he needed much more mass than he could find in the shiny stuff in the stars. And so he had ended up describing this 
finding dark matter because there's some matter that it's not shining. And he knew how fast things were moving. They were moving at maybe a few hundred to a few thousand kilometers a second, which is non-relativistic or cold motion. He did not know um, this was non-baryonic because this number hadn't been pinned down at that point. Um, this turned out to be about 25% starting maybe in the 80s and 90s, um, much more recently than Zwicky's stuff in the 1930s. More recently, people have discovered something even stranger, and they call it dark energy. So this is energy, not in the sense of kinetic energy or mechanical energy, but it's a way to distinguish this substance from the matter. And it's also dark. It does not seem to absorb or emit light. And if it's made up of particles, these particles will be very, very light mass. And so they're going to be moving at speeds close to the speed of light. And so they're moving relativistically. It's also non-baryonic. And this is the biggest contribution to the energy budget now. And this is what was discovered um, in these measurements of the supernovae um, in 1997, 1998, um, where they found the accelerated expansion so basically, we don't understand 95% of the stuff out there at the present time. So let me outline this talk a little bit. So I'm going to try to motivate dark energy a bit more. And then we'll look at two dark energy models. One's the standard model where you have a cos cosmological constant, and the CDM stands for cold dark matter. Then I'll turn that cosmological model into a dynamical scalar field model where I'll give the scalar field a potential energy density and let that change gradually in time. And a lot of um, data analysis is done in terms of this fluid model, the XCDM model. So I'll talk about that a little bit also. So we're going to take these models and make predictions for observations and then compare the observations um, that we have to the predictions we make and end up constraining the model parameters that way. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the transition from the past when the expansion was decelerating to the time now when it's accelerating. And if you have time, I'll talk about measurements of the Hubble constant and measurements of spatial curvature and open issues. So the issue in cosmology now is we have pretty nice data, but we're not doing particle physics. We don't have results that we can go back into the lab and reproduce. We have this one universe and we have data. And it's very difficult to do to any model independent conclusion. So the best thing you can do at present is to make a cosmological model, a physically consistent one with five or six or seven or eight different parameters. And then just try to constrain those parameters. And this way you can do analysis of very different data sets. You can do the CMB, baryon acoustic oscillations, and then compare your results. And if your results agree, then you're happy with your cosmological model. If your results don't agree, then that's either telling you your cosmological model is ruled out or there's some systematic errors in your data and there's something wrong. And so you can make progress like this and you can combine constraints from different data sets. So um, we know that the universe is expanding. This is Hubble's law. Um, Slifer measured the redshifts. And then Humerson went back and redid those and from Doppler's formula, because these are nearby, you can use the usual Doppler formula. And now you have to use the, the one, the relativistic formula. You can get the velocities at which these galaxies are moving and um, they turn out to be proportional to the distance. So Hubble went and in the beginning, he used um, Henrietta Leavitt's formula for period luminosity of Cepheids, and that's how he got distances. And so you have a linear relation between the velocity, recession velocity and the distances and the constant of proportionality is the Hubble constant. And this is my favorite value of the Hubble constant, somewhere around 68 or 69. And it's been that way for me for the last 20 years or so. And I'll talk more about this um, in a bit. So this is um, one of the really famous measurements of the Hubble law. It's from Wendy Friedman's group from 2001. Um, she was the PI on one of the key projects of the Hubble Space Telescope. And the recession velocities on this axis, the distances are here. These are um, the residuals. We can forget that the distances are here. This is the best fit line then. And the slope is the Hubble constant. It's about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec then. And I still favor around 68 or 69. 
And this number is consistent with many, many measurements of the Hubble constant. So here's an example of the issues that some measurements of the Hubble constant lead to. So certain um, groups get a higher Hubble constant, maybe around 74 or so. And this number is from 2011. It's much tighter now, it's roughly 74 plus or minus one. And um, here's the 68. So what I've done is I've taken these data from WMAP, um, large-scale CMB, small-scale CMB from Akbar, ACE ACT, and SPT, and galaxy clustering data from SDSS, and fit this to a model. Um, this is the flat lambda CDM model, and marginalized over all the other parameters and just left H naught here, and the number of degrees of relativistic degrees of freedom, so usually called neutrinos, in the standard model, we have three neutrinos, and um, I'm just going to leave that as a parameter, and I'm going to use priors from these Hubble constants. So the, the just Gaussian priors with the width being 2.4 and 2.8, and you can see that the red ones, one and two sigma, don't overlap with the standard model of particle physics, uh, number of degrees of freedom for neutrinos. They're away a little more than two sigma. The blue ones are consistent at one sigma, so it's pretty striking that the standard model of particle physics favors 68 over 74, because if you go back 20 or 25 years, we couldn't decide between 50 and 100. So we have an expanding universe, so we have preferred observers. And so you have to be careful when you phrase um, things. You have to phrase them in terms of these guys, the cosmological observers, those guys who are locally addressed with respect to the expansion. And so we'll assume the cosmological principle, which is kind of the generalization of the Copernican principle, that is no matter where you are, if you observe the universe, it's going to look the same to you. And um, it's going to look spatially isotropic. So if it looks spatially isotropic for more than two points in space, um, then there's a theorem in geometry that tells you that it's spatially homogeneous. And that makes life much simpler. So we get um, just these three famous Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker solutions, the closed one, the open one, and the flat one. And um, the flat one and the open one have to go out to infinity in uh, both dimensions. I'm suppressing one spatial dimension because I can't draw the three-dimensional ones here. And the curvature, so this is the line element. Um, this is a spatial scale factor that shows up over here. The curvature is positive, negative, and zero. And omega, um, which is the density parameter, I'll define that on the next slide, is greater than one, less than one, and critical value of one. And I'm, I'm ignoring dark energy for now when I give you these values of omega. Um, so. The equations of motion, so the dynamical degree of freedom, you can kind of loosely think about it in terms of the radius of the sphere. As time goes on, it gets bigger and bigger. And we can write down um, the equivalent for um, like what you do with the harmonic oscillator after you integrate F equal to MA once and get the energy conservation equation. That's the thing I'm writing down here that's equivalent to that energy conservation equation for the harmonic oscillator. So you have the rate of change of the scale factor, and then you have the contribution from gravity from the mass density, it's mass per unit volume, that's what rho is. Space curvature gives you a contribution to powering the expansion, and the cosmological constant also does, so I've included all three. And then a rho changes with time, so we'll use energy conservation on the first law of thermodynamics and get um, the PDV work, and so that's the expansion of the universe that's you're getting over here. And to complete this, you need an equation of state. So if you know the equation of state, you can integrate these. And the first thing you might be interested in is trying to figure out whether you have accelerated expansion or not, because you know um, A dot over A, which is expansion rate, is positive. Things are moving away from you. So you can take the first derivative of this equation and do some calculus, and then you get the acceleration equation, the second Friedman equation, that tells you that the acceleration is proportional to a bunch of stuff on the right-hand side. So space curvature doesn't contribute to this equation. The things that do are matter. So by matter, I mean ordinary matter and baryonic matter, and then the cosmological constant. 
So if we ignore all of this for now um, and just focus on this term, um, if I wasn't using natural units, there'd be a C squared in the denominator here. So the pressure is the relativistic effect. Um, the rho is coming from the rest mass energy of the substances you're looking at. So you can see there's a minus sign over here. And if you have ordinary matter, you're going to predict decelerated expansion. So the Big Bang starts and then things start slowing down. So the person driving the expansion of the universe has a foot on the brake. And so you go and tell your observer friends that you predict decelerated expansion and they come back and tell you they measured the accelerated expansion. So you have a problem here. You have to either discard this equation and say Einstein's general relativity is incorrect. Or if you are a little bit conservative and know that it works really well for black holes and it works really well for gravity waves and it works reasonably well for the microwave background, you might want to try to patch this up by introducing a new substance. And that new substance we're going to call a cosmological constant. And it has an equation of state that's P equal to minus rho. So inside the round parentheses here, if you add them all up, it's minus two rho lambda. And if you make rho lambda much bigger than rho matter, you can make everything inside the square parentheses negative. And that'll give you a positive here because of this minus sign and you'll be consistent with the predicted accelerated expansion. So that's what dark energy is introduced for. It's to introduce to fix the equations of general relativity and make them agree with the observations. And that would be a silly thing to do if you just have one observation to go and modify your theory so much. But we have half a dozen different observations and they all seem to indicate roughly the same amount of dark energy. So it's a reasonable thing to do. And we can just test these dark energy models. So in the simplest model, you have the einstein Sitter case where space curvature is zero, lambda is equal to zero. And then um, the energy density or the matter density rho is uh, proportional to um, the Hubble constant squared and inversely proportional to Newton's constant. And so once you measure the Hubble constant, you've got rho. And that's the einstein Sitter model. And this number is called einstein Sitter energy density. H is the fudge factor in rho. So it's roughly 10 to the minus 29 grams per cubic centimeter. And then we define the density parameter, which is rho divided by the critical energy density. So you don't have to carry around 10 to the minus 29 grams everywhere. So dark energy, um, the easy way to think about it is think about the Hubble law in two different universes. Really, we should be using apparent magnitude here. But if you do this in um, the Hubble law, then in, you have a slowly expanding universe and a more rapidly expanding universe. In the slowly expanding one, the galaxy at distance d is moving away more slowly than the galaxy at the same distance in the more rapidly expanding universe. So as you go out further and further in distance, it takes longer and longer for that light to get to you. And so you're seeing the universe as it was earlier. And so there's three options. You want to try to measure um, the expansion rate as a function of distance from you. So it could be that it was constant, like the purple line, or it could be that in the past that the universe expanded more slowly, like the blue line, as it came to the present, it expanded more rapidly. That would be an accelerating universe. And the other case is a decelerating universe. As you go out further, it expands more rapidly. And you come back closer, it expands more slowly. And in the 1990s, the things you could use to measure the expansion rate as a function of redshift, as a function of distance, were the type 1a supernovae. And they all showed up in the blue part of the diagram. So they favored um, this blue model, the ex accelerated expansion. And all of you have probably seen plots like this, where you look at the contours from the supernovae and what they favor in the omega lambda, omega matter space. And if there was no um, lambda, then you should have a sit on the zero line over here. But the supernovae favor this region here. And this is from all supernovae data. So current data, maybe it's now it's like five and four and a half or five sigma detection of dark energy just from the supernovae. Um, so it's telling you that on the right-hand side of the acceleration equation, P has to be less than minus rho over three. 
So we know that there's um, dark energy, that it's a major contributor to the energy budget now, but we don't know anything else about it, whether it's a cosmological constant or whether it's dynamical. And so that's what I want to talk about a bit. And um, so when we want to discuss something like this, we've got to assume that um, we, we know what the, the equations we're going to use. We're going to assume that general theory of relativity is correct on cosmological scales. And we're going to also assume that the astronomers um, have all their systematic errors under control. And so if you want to try to answer a question like this, you can build a model with the cosmological constant, or you can build a model with dynamical dark energy, make predictions and compare to observations. So I'm going to show you first three different models. So this is the Lambda CDM model, the standard model now. And this is at relatively late time. So I'm going to ignore the radiation of the photons. And it's on a log log plot. Um, so this is log of the energy density and this is log of the scale factor. And I'm just gonna draw um, the contributions of the energy from the energy budget. So this is the, the first Friedman equation, the Hubble parameter squared is, has contributions from ordinary and dark matter, from space curvature and from lambda. Lambda doesn't evolve with A, so it's a horizontal line, it's a green line. This guy drops like one over a squared, so it's the orange line. And both these guys, the dark matter and the baryonic matter, are effectively pressureless. So their energy is coming from rest mass energy. And so it's one over a cubed. It's just the volume in the denominator. And that's the blue line. So over here, you can see the green line dominates. And so you're going to get accelerated expansion. As you go back a little bit, uh, the blue line dominates over the other two. And so you'll get decelerated expansion because it's pressureless. And it appears that you have three degrees of freedom here. There's only actually two, and we'll see that in a second. And conventionally, um, it's the matter density parameter at the present time and the cosmological constant density parameter at the present, and that's independent of time. Um, so that's what's chosen to parameterize this model. So we can see that this line is horizontal here and it's energy density. So it's energy divided by volume. So if you write it in natural units, it's energy to the fourth power. And so if you take the square root of that, a fourth root of that, you get an energy scale. And that energy scale is around a milli electron volt. And that's very disturbing to particle physicists because um, until very recently, there was nothing fundamental about that energy scale. Um, so particle physicists don't want to be forced to introduce a new fundamental energy scale of a milli electron volt just because these observations of dark energy. So right now, um, there are suggestions that maybe neutrino masses are around that energy scale and maybe there's some connection between dark energy and neutrino masses, but I haven't seen a, a workable model of that. So if you want to get rid of this milli electron volt scale, what you can do is you can change the slope. Um, and so you have enough time so you can go back into the early universe and then get a, a, an energy scale of a much, much higher value and then as time goes on, that scale is going to drop down to zero or closer to a milli electron volt. And that's why the fundamental scale could be GV or TV or something even higher. And one way to do that is to introduce a fluid. And for these next two models, I'm going to make them flat to make it a little bit simpler. And we'll put back spatial curvature later. So you introduce a fluid, which we're going to call an X fluid with an equation of state of this form. And if you choose omega sub x to be less than minus one third, you can get accelerated expansion. And then you have the green line, but it's no longer horizontal. As you go back in time, it goes to a higher and higher energy scale. So maybe it's a milli electron volt now because it's been slowly decreasing with time and the universe is quite old. So again, you get accelerated expansion here and decelerated expansion earlier on. And because I've thrown away spatial curvature, I still only have two parameters. I'll choose omega matter now and uh, small omega sub x, the equation of state parameter to be the two parameters. So the problem with this model is that when you take uh, DPD rho, which gives you the speed of sound squared and you take the square root, it's negative. You take the square root of a negative number 
And that's telling you that inhomogeneities will grow on an exponential time scale and the universe will become extremely inhomogeneous. And so it doesn't look anything like our universe. So what people say is that um, they're just going to choose to ignore this and just set it equal to one, the speed of sound squared. Um, and that's how they parameterize this model. Um, so one way you can make this consistent is to introduce a scalar field with the potential energy density and the potential energy density for so the contribution. So we get the Friedman equation. Now you consider rho sub x, you get rho sub phi. And because you introduce the scale of field, rho sub phi is the kinetic energy piece. So that's a phi dot squared. And then a potential energy density. So that's the inverse phi law potential energy density that we introduced in 1988. And I'll come back and explain why this is interesting. But it's a dynamical variable now, and so you need to also solve the Klein-Gordon equation in, in, in the expanding universe. So again, I've chosen it to be spatially flat, so I just have two parameters, omega matter now, and this parameter alpha, which is the index of the potential energy density. And this is special because with... Oh, uh, this is... Sorry, this is a, it should be kappa. Yeah, so this is zero. This is kappa. Yeah, it's not that spatial curvature. It's another parameter. It's just the normalization of the potential energy density. And uh, yeah, I'll have to change that. Thank you. So it's, it's spatially flat. And this is a nonlinear potential energy density. And it gives you an attractor solution for the scalar field and for the expansion of the universe. And that's really useful because um, it doesn't depend on the initial conditions you give the scalar field. Lots of initial conditions will be drawn to the solution. It's also useful because this solution wants to make the dark energy come to dominate no matter whether you have matter or even if you go back into the radiation epoch. So it's subdominant in the past and then it comes to dominate. And that's one problem with the cosmological constant, why it contributes roughly the same amount of energy density as other things now. And maybe this explains why we're transitioning um, now to a dark energy dominated epoch. And it also gets rid of this MeV scale. So I want to make predictions from these models. And for illustrative purposes, I'm going to use older data because the error bars are bigger and you can see the contours more clearly. So I look at supernovae data, barren acoustic data, barren acoustic oscillations, Hubble parameter data, and growth factors, a function of redshift. And um, let me just illustrate how we do this. So instead of using um, scale factor, um, we work in terms of redshift, which is uh, one plus redshift is the ratio of the wavelength that you observe compared to the wavelength at the time it was emitted. And in terms of scale factor, it's a ratio of the scale factor now to the scale factor when the radiation was emitted. And so we can rewrite the Friedman equation in the lambda CDM model in terms of redshift. And so this is the matter contribution. It was one over A cubed. So you get one over one plus Z cubed, one plus Z cubed, and omega curvature divided by A squared. So it's one plus Z squared and omega lambda. And you can see that if you look at this at the present time, the Hubble parameter becomes the Hubble constant and they cancel out. And one plus Z is one in all cases. So you get omega matter plus omega curvature plus omega lambda now equal to one. So you have a sum rule. And even though it appeared there were three degrees of freedom, omega matter, omega lambda, and um, omega curvature, there's only two because the sum rule has to be obeyed. And this is the, the expansion function. The square of the expansion function is just this quantity over here. So you can predict the Hubble parameter as a function of redshift, as a function of the parameters of your model, as a function of the Hubble constant in terms of uh, this quantity here. And so once you have this prediction, you can look at the observations at those redshifts and then use chi-squared a maximum likelihood or whatever you want to constrain the things you'll constrain because your input is going to be um, the redshift Z and it depends how you treat the Hubble constant. We'll come back to that later, but you effectively can constrain these cosmological parameters. 
And so I'm going to do this in a lot of these, in these models for a lot of different data sets. So I'll show you plots like this. In this corner, we have the Lambda CDM model. In this corner, the XCDM model. In this corner, the Phi CDM model. And it's, they're two-dimensional because there's just two free parameters, omega lambda, omega matter, W sub X, omega matter, alpha, and omega matter. And we're going to, sorry, take these data and get constraints. So I'll start out with the type 1A supernovae. This is an old data set from 10 years ago. And oh, we're going to derive constraints. So you'll get these contours here. So there's one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, and best fit. One sigma, two sigma, three sigma, and best fit. One sigma, the two interior ones, two sigma, three sigma, and best fit. And there's also some other lines over here. So this bold dashed line corresponds to zero space curvature in this model. So when you're up here, you're closed, and when you're down here, you're open. This corresponds to the flat lambda CDM model with W sub X equal to minus one. So over here, um, you expand, your um, expansion is slower than in the lambda CDM model, and here it's faster than the lambda CDM model. And this line over here corresponds again to a flat lambda CDM model. So every model on this line and on this line and on this line is identical if you choose the same value of omega matter. So a model with omega matter of 0.3 here is exactly the same as a model with omega matter of 0.3 here. And it's exactly the same as the model with omega matter of 0.3 here. So we can look at what these data are telling us and they're telling us some really general things. So first, um, the contours are all, okay, so this, this is the, the difference when you have current acceleration will be above this, current deceleration below, current deceleration above it, current acceleration below, current deceleration here, current acceleration here. So all, most of the data um, contours are in the region where you have current acceleration. So it doesn't matter what model you use to analyze the supernova data with, they're going to always predict accelerated expansion. So the other thing you can notice is that the standard model, which is omega matter of about 0.3 and omega lambda of about 0.7 and curvature close to zero, is well within the one sigma contour. And it doesn't matter what model you use for that analysis. So omega matter of 0.3, omega lambda of 0.7 is around here, it's inside one sigma omega matter of 0.3, omega lambda of 0.7 is here. So the standard model is completely consistent with these data, but there's lots of room for space curvature. The contours are pretty broad. There's lots of room for dark energy dynamics. The contours are pretty broad. So we can go to the next data compilation, which is <clears throat> the barrier and acoustic oscillation data. And immediately you see something very interesting. So if you focus on this, plot and look at the way these contours are aligned and compare them to the way the supernovae contours are aligned. They're almost orthogonal. So you can kind of see what's going to happen when you combine barrier and acoustic oscillations with supernovae. They're going to constrain you to a much tighter part of parameter space. But before we do that, let's just look at what these barrier and acoustic oscillations tell you. Again, most of the parameter space space favored by the data is in the accelerated part. The standard model is quite consistent in all cases. It's right almost near the center of the one sigma contour. And there's lots of space for space curvature and for dark energy dynamics. And you can do this with the Hubble parameter data. So here we're going to include um, H naught as a prior. So we have two sets, we have 68 and 74. And then we marginalize over H naught. So the solid lines are those with the H naught prior of 68. The dash dotted lines are those with the H naught prior of 0.738. And you can see the contours move maybe by half sigma. It doesn't move a lot, but there's an issue here. And so you can kind of think of this as a systematic issue. Uh, again, um, this, this accelerated expansion is consistent with these data. 
And uh, the standard model is consistent with them and the space for spatial curvature and for dark energy dynamics. And you can do this with growth factor data and it's the same sort of conclusion. So I'm not going to talk about that. But basically, um, this is the really important part that the constraints from the different data sets are not inconsistent. They all want accelerated expansion and they're all pointing towards dark energy if you have uh, a strong belief that general relativity is correct. So the individual data sets are consistent with the standard model with omega mat lambda of about 0.7, omega matter of 0.3, and they don't rule out um, space curvature, dark energy dynamics. So obviously the next thing is you do two data sets at a time, and this is supernovae and BAO, and the part of parameter space they favor when you use two data sets are much smaller. Um, you can compare to the older plots I showed you, but again, um, they're all favoring the standard model and this leave you some room for space curvature, some room for dark energy dynamics. And it doesn't matter what data sets you combine. So this is Hubble parameter and BAO again, because we're accounting for the two different Hubble constant values. The contours move maybe by half a sigma, but they're all consistent roughly with the standard model and they allow for space curvature and dark energy dynamics. And I'll just flip through this. And um, so again, uh, the standard model is quite consistent with these constraints. And you have some room um, to allow for dark energy dynamics and space curvature. And you immediately start seeing different issues with these data that there's systematic errors. So you have to try to pin down H naught. And I could have shown you what happens when you vary omega baryons. I could have shown you that um, different supernovae compilations move things by half a sigma or so. Or if I use different GRB data, they move things by half a sigma, so maybe one sigma. So there are systematic errors, and I'll show you um, the best quality um, current data now in a bit. But before I get to that, I want to change gears a little bit and show you first that you can actually measure this deceleration, acceleration, transition. And so what I'm going to plot here is the Hubble parameter data, and I'm dividing it by one plus the redshift. So it doesn't um, give you a very sharply growing um, plot because then everything would have to be condensed, but I want to kind of have it almost roughly flat as a function of redshift. And I'm showing you 28 different uh, measurements of the Hubble parameter here, and you really can't conclude much unless I tell you what these lines are. So there's six models over here in the center, and there's two models up here. And these six central models are the best fitting models. So they're in three pairs. And one corresponds to a Hubble constant of 73.8, the other Hubble constant of 68. And the three models are the Lambda CDM, the XCDM, and the Phi CDM. And these are all the best fit models. And they're what favored by the data. And if you look at models, the three sigma away from being favored by the data, it's either a flat line or it's a line that do drops a lot and then flattens out. But um, if you want to see this more clearly, I can bin the low redshift data and show you that plot. And maybe that makes it a little bit clearer here. So in this plot, I was showing you one sigma error bars and everything. So here, for the low redshift stuff, I'm going to show you two sigma error bars, one and two sigma. And you can see that all these best fit models, I mean, you can barely distinguish between them. And that's the problem with current data. You can't tell the difference between the dark energy models, but you can see the transition really clearly here. And if you want to interpret this in the Lambda CDM model, this H plus one plus Z is this quantity and at low redshift, um, the one plus Z squared here is gonna be more important. And this is gonna be less important and so you see the positive slope here. You see the accelerated expansion from omega lambda and high redshift, this is gonna be suppressed and omega matter is gonna dominate. And you see this slope over here um, from the decelerated expansion. So you can see there's a decelerated expansion and then accelerated expansion and the transitions around a redshift of about three quarters. Okay, so I wanna make another shift here and I'm gonna to go to the latest data and I want to measure the Hubble constant. 
And I'm going to do this in a way that's independent of local calibrators like the Cepheids. I'm going to do this in a way that's independent of the CMB because I'm going to measure um, the acoustic scale from um, the, the, basically the sound horizon at drag epoch. I'm going to measure this from these data too by actually just using omega b h squared and omega c h squared as parameters and then computing for each of those values, compute the sound horizon and drag epoch. So this is all completely independent of the CMB measurement of H naught. It's also completely independent of local calibrators like the Cepheids and the tip of the red giant branch. So the data I'm going to use are barren acoustic oscillation data that go up to a redshift of about 2.3 upper parameter data that go to redshift of two, um, supernovae data that go to redshift of 2.3, um, quasar angular size data that go to redshift of about 2.7, reverberation measured quasar data, both the MT2 line and the C4 line, MT2 data go up to redshift of 1.9, and the C4 go up to redshift of 3.4, and Amati correlated gamma ray burst data that go up to a redshift of 8.2. And I'm going to fit these to six different models, the flat lambda CDM non -tri. How do we get the HC data? Uh, so we get it from cosmic, cosmic chronometers. So yeah, it's, it's, um, so it's comparing galaxies. I, I, so we can talk about that later. So, um, so we'll fit these models to these data and just marginalize over everything. And you get um, the Hubble constant. So it's between uh, about 68.9 uh, and 69.5. So it's somewhere uh, the best fit, if you just say the best fit from these six models, is somewhere around 69.2 or 69.3. But I, I'll kind of use the 69.5 lambda CDM, flat lambda CDM value. The error bars are all about plus minus 2.4. So this number that I was using earlier, this was from 2001, and it's a median statistics analysis of 553 measurements of the Hubble constant. There's about 800 now. So the Hubble constant is the most measured parameter in science. Um, so this number, what we're getting now, maybe 69.5 plus or minus two, is more consistent with this and also with uh, Wendy Friedman's group um, using the tip of the red giant branch to calibrate supernovas and then using the supernovas to get out further to get the Hubble constant. Um, her group gets 69.8 plus or minus 1.7. Well, Adam Reese's group, when he uses Cepheids and supernovae, get about 73 um, plus or minus one. So, so there, there clearly is a Hubble tension. Um, Low redshift measurements of the Hubble constant do not agree with each other. So this is the really important point. There's not, uh, we cannot say at present that there's a Hubble tension between low redshift and a CMB, but there is a problem at low redshift of measuring the Hubble constant. And if you cannot sort that out, you can't say anything about a Hubble tension between the CMB and um, the low redshift measurement of the Hubble constant, which is what people usually mean by the Hubble tension now. Um, so the CMB gives you maybe 67 and a half plus or minus a half from Planck. But if you go to the other CMB experiments, ACT and SPT, they're also completely consistent. So you'll notice that all the CMB values are completely consistent with these low redshift measurements of the Hubble constant, but they differ from um, Cepheids and type 1a supernovae so it's going to be really interesting resolving what's happening at low redshift with the Hubble constant and maybe um, the tip of the red giant branch and this median statistics analysis, their error bars are pretty large. And maybe this is what the number will turn out to be eventually because they're not that far away. I mean, this number, for, I mean, the 69.5 plus or minus 2.4 is only about one and a half sigma from here. And if we can get tighter error bars by using more data, then. That uh, Friedman supernova sample and the real supernova sample are they the same? Supernova? They're roughly the same, but they're not quite the same. Yeah, the, the, the big issue is the calibration between tip of the red giant branch and the Cepheids.
And I mean, yeah, you can go look at the papers and see. And I mean, that's that's a big problem right now. Okay, so I, I don't know how much time I have. Did you want me to stop or you want me? Okay, so okay, okay. So the next thing I want to do is talk about uh, space curvature. So some of you are probably aware that uh, the Planck data by themselves favor a mildly closed universe. But when you add a BAO or uh, some non-CMB data, then it prefers a flat universe. And in that case, they're kind of assuming the standard lambda CDM model, but possibly things become more complicated when you have dynamical dark energy. And the other point is if you have non-flat models, then maybe you're not forced to dynamical dark energy. Um, so we want to look at dark energy dynamics and space curvature together. And so we'll consider adding back space curvature to XCDM. And so I'll put in this orange line, and now we have three parameters, omega matter now, omega curvature now, and W sub X, so omega sub X. And I'll put back in um, the curvature in the phi CDM model. And so we have three parameters, omega matter, not omega curvature, and alpha now. <clears throat> And I, at first, I won't use the CMB data because for the CMB, you need to have um, a pass spectrum. But I'll just use this most recent data, non-CMB data compilation. And <clears throat> I'll just tell you the results. So we've looked at every single constraint from each of these data sets individually. And we've made sure that they're consistent with each other before we did a joint analysis. And along the way, we've had to discard a number of data sets that people have been using in cosmology, and then we discovered problems with them. So one of them is the X-ray UV luminosity quasars, which people have been saying that they disagree with the standard, standard model, and its constraints are just not consistent from model to model, and it's in, also not consistent between high and reg, low redshift QSOs. And it turns out that's because um, there's dust that's affecting these data. And we also looked at reverberation measured H beta data, and that's also not um, consistent from model to model. So we didn't use that. We used um, starburst galaxy data, and that's also not consistent um, from high and low redshift starburst galaxies. So we didn't use that. But if we use these data, um, so we find that they're roughly consistent with flat geometry in all the six models we looked at. The deviations are at most a little bit more than one sigma. But dark energy dynamics seems to be favored by about two sigma in these models. So um, the next thing you want to do is, okay, let me just kind of introduce one of these new data sets, the reverberation measured MG2 and C4 quasars. So what we have here is an AGN, which has a supermassive black hole. And then there's the clouds around it that give you the broad line um, emission. So energy goes out from here, flows out. And if you can measure um, how that flux from the central, around the central black hole fluctuates in time, then you can see those same sort of peaks and troughs from the, the broad line stuff. And so you can figure out how long it takes to get there um, because it's traveling It's traveling at the speed of light. So you measure this in the broad line emission and in from the central AGN, from the central black hole. And they're at different, um, so those are the wavelengths. And then you find there's a correlation between the, the time lag and the absolute luminosity. And this is one example, it's not great. But um, for MG2, we can find compilations of 50, 60, 70 of these systems where um, the slope, the beta and gamma parameters are independent of what cosmological model you use to analyze these data. So if you can show that's true, then you're showing that these are standard candles, that you can use this um, time delay measurements to get the absolute lumen. Luminosity. And once you've got the absolute luminosity in the redshift, you can use these as standard candles. And uh, it's not very tight now. So all these constraints that I show you are basically almost entirely from BAO, HC, and supernovae. Um, but um, they get tightened up a little bit by quasar angular size and reverberation measured quasars and GRB data. Um, 
So the interesting thing is um, LSST should get 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 subsystems and not the order 10 to the 2 that we're dealing with now. So you've got a 10 to the 2 increase in data. And maybe if these are still standard candles with the SST data, they'll be really useful. So um, maybe I'll try to do this really quickly. So we want to look at um, CMB data. So we'll go back to this model and um, try to look at the far spectrum. So you've got a new scale in here. So it's not fair to use the Harrison Peebles use Eldovich spectrum anymore. And um, what Planck did is they did that, and I'll show you what they did. So in the spatially flat case, because you just have one length scale, which is the Hubble parameter. Um, so the spectrum, the naivest thing you can say is it's going to be K divided by that one length scale or multiplied by that one length scale, um, depending on how you use this, um, and, and raised to some power. And when you go to a closed model or an open model, so I'm just talking about the closed model here because it's a little bit different, you get an ex additional length scale, which is the space curvature length scale. So this naive argument doesn't work anymore. And so you want to compute um, the power spectrum. So the curved case, you look at the eigenvalues of spatial Laplacian and capital A is discrete um, because you have discrete modes there. And this parameter Q is capital A plus one. So A equals zero and one are gauge modes. And so we throw them away. Um, so we looked at this in um, open models. And then I looked at it later in closed models that are slowly rolling. And you get a much more complicated bar spectrum of this form than K to the one. And because tilt is really important, so Planck, what Planck did in the analysis is they took this slowly rolling result and multiplied it by k to the n minus one to get tilt. And they didn't show that you can get the spectrum from an inflation model. Um, I'm working with uh, Alan Guth and Mohammed uh, Hussein Namju on trying to see if we can get this from an op open or closed inflation model. We're more interested in closed right now, so we're focusing on closed. And we find that from numerical computations that you can get a spectrum that's close to this. So maybe what Planck did was reasonable, but you can also um, do another calculation. And I did that in a, a more rapidly evolving inflation model with the complicated potential. So if you want to see it, you can go look at this paper because the expressions for the potential are really complicated. And I'll just show you what the power spectrum looks like in the closed case and the open case. So the straight line is the, the best fit, tilted flat lambda CDM model, the blue line. And then I'm showing you um, the closed models relative to it. So if you don't tilt the closed models, you get the green line and it's a green line over here, the dashed line, the dots correspond to um, where you have power because it's discrete. So um, the model that Planck used is the black line over here and that this model is the red line. So you can see they're relatively close, but they are different. And if you go over to the open models, again, they're slightly different. Um, so you can do the computation and compare to data. So the data I'm gonna use, uh, what I'm gonna call P18, which is the TT, TE, and EE um, data points at various L's, and then the low E stuff, which comes from their map analysis, that's L of um, below 29 and lower, I believe. And then I'll also use the gravitational lensing data from Planck. And then from non-CMB data, I'll use 16 BAO measurements, including four growth factor ones and four ind eight individual growth factor ones. And the Pantheon, the older Pantheon and DES supernovae, and uh, age Hubble parameter measurements. And I'll look at six models, um, the flat tilted model, the non-flat tilted model with the Planck power spectrum, the non-flat tilted model with this new power spectrum. And these are in pairs. One pair is with capital A equal to one, the other is with capital A varying. So this is the lensing consistency parameter. And this has been introduced because the Planck data seems to be a little bit smoother at some high L regions than you'd expect in the standard Lambda CDM model that best fits these data. 
And some people think that this might be due to um, gravitational lensing of um, those points. And so they introduced this parameter AL and it parameterizes how much of the gravitational lensing potential correlation function you're going to include in your analysis. And for consistency, you expect AL to be one at the end of this analysis. This is not a physical model that explains that extra smoothing in the Planck data, but it's just a consistency test. And we, we have felt we had to introduce this because there's some degeneracy between omega curvature and AL. And so we didn't want to just fix AL and just look at omega curvature then. So um, this is a very complicated slide. So I'll start out first with AL equal to one and then look at AL varying models. And with AL equal to one models, um, I'm going to look at the consistency between different data sets in these models. So I look at consistency between the P18 data, which is this part of the Planck data and the lensing Planck data. And then I look at the consistency between Planck data and the non-CMB data, which is this. And so we're doing um, uh, uh, this in a couple of ways. We're just seeing whether the constraints from these data, two data sets are consistent with each other. I mean, you can do this very naively by drawing all the contours and seeing if there's overlap or not. And this kind of condenses a little bit. So we can do this um, using DIC deviance information criteria and um, this paper has done this uh, with the DIC statistic for gravitational lensing and there's a, a slight extension of that in this these groups of papers where they have called this thing suspicionless and uh, we're using a Gaussian approximation for the suspicionless and then turning it into uh, how, how, sig how many sigma these data sets are deviant by. So you can see that the P18 and lensing data um, for the standard model, they're completely consistent, but when you go to the non-flat models, they're deviant by about two or two and a half sigma. And if you do this with P18 and non-CMB, even for the standard model, you're starting to see a two sigma discrepancy. And for the non-flat models, uh, for the Planck spectrum, it's three sigma discrepant. And for the new pass spectrum, it's about two and a half sigma discrepant. So um, because these are so discrepant, I'm not going to jointly analyze these data to give you omega kappa, omega k, but two and a half sigma, maybe I can tolerate and I'll do a joint analysis. And then I measure omega curvature and it's completely consistent with flat. So um, the suggestion that um, th these data sets don't overlap, which is being made in this paper, uh, by Di Valentino, Mercury, and Silk, um, they're arguing that the data are inconsistent, so you can't conclude anything. But just because the data are inconsistent with each other, you can conclude that this model is not consistent with one of these data sets or both of these data sets, and so it's ruled out. And if it is consistent, it gives you flat spatial curvature. Now I'll let AL vary, and we'll look at, um, again, the Planck 18 versus non-CMB. And um, this discrepancy reduces quite a bit. And so it seems to be somehow related to being fixed, the AL being fixed. And so because um, they're not discrepant, we can kind of combine them and measure omega curvature. And in both cases, they're very, very, very consistent with flat. But the problem comes with when you then try to measure um, the lensing consistency parameter, it's about two and a half sigma discrepant from what you would expect um, the value of omega equal to one. And this might be a problem or it might not be a problem because ACT and SPT, they have bigger error bars. And um, when they measure omega A sub L, they're not that discrepant as the Planck case is. And so maybe we just have to wait and see what ACT and SPT and um, S4 come up with. So I probably should just skip this and um, just go to my conclusions because I'm running out of time. So I think these are the uh, main issues in cosmology now. What is dark energy, whether the universe is closed, whether AL not equal to one is a problem for standard lambda CDM and what is dark matter? 
Um, so this one, we're just going to have to wait um, for more CMB data and see if it continues to be an issue or not. And ACT and SPT seem to suggest that it's not an issue, but their error bars are bigger. So maybe um, they, when they have more data, they'll be able to conclude something about this. Um, I don't think the universe is closed. I think it's probably flat. And maybe um, when we better understand other non-flat inflation models, we might come to a different conclusion because the bar spectrum in non-flat models is not as unique as it is in the flat case. And so we need to look at these different bar spectra and try to do the analysis of different bar spectra. For dark energy, uh, a cosmological constant works really, really well. Um, and maybe that's that's the model. Um, so current data probably cannot yet rule out mild dark energy dynamics. I mean, I think um, general relativity is correct. And I don't think um, it's an issue um, of modified gravity that's going to explain this. And I think the astronomy observations for dark energy are, are pretty secure because you get like at least half a dozen different um, ways of testing dark energy and they're all roughly consistent. And in the next decade or so, um, DES and Euclid and um, um, Roman will be pretty important. Uh, Roman maybe a little bit later, DES and Euclid maybe even in this decade. Um, and for dark matter, we don't know what it is. Um, it could be supersymmetry or axions, and maybe in the next five years, we'll find missing energy at CERN, or we'll find some direct detection at these deep underground and other uh, laboratories for dark matter. Uh, there might be some issues with um, the standard model for dark matter, the simplest one, like at the course of galaxies and clusters, and um, maybe one way to deal with that is to couple um, dark matter to dark energy. So um, all, all the dark energy models I was talking about only couple gravitationally, but we could probably introduce a direct coupling. And that becomes a really messy thing to do because you could have many, many, many different kinds of direct couplings with many different kinds of dark matter models. And it's not clear um, how you're gonna conclude anything model depend independent. So after you've resolved the issues of uh, um, dark energy, dark matter, spatial curvature, and lens inconsistency, cosmology is not over. So I'll just leave that up there. So you don't have to worry that your PhD is going to be useless after you've done that and resolved dark energy and dark matter. Thank you. OK. That's it. Yes. Yeah. So, I think you want to see what on the phone. So, why is the problem? I mean, my CD model is huge here. This potential land is like a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't hear the last bit. Yeah, yeah alpha, is yeah, alpha is greater than zero. Yeah. That's right. But uh, my question is the following: I mean, there are several models that can be priced to detect stable effects. So why should we consider standard models? Why there are several models that can give yes. you an attractor? The exponential model. Which also so the exponential the model um, gives you the wrong kind of attractor. So if you go back. Um, do this plot I had, the beginning. Okay, maybe I can go to even this YCBM model plot here. So what the exponential potential model, and you can read this in our 1988 paper. I mean, that's the first model we looked at. Um, so the attractor it gives you in, in as a function of the scale factor, it has exactly the same dependence um, as the dominant source of energy density in that epoch. So the dark energy density in the matter-dominated epoch will be one over a cubed, and the dark energy density in the matter-dominated epoch, in the radiation-dominated epoch, will be one over a four with an exponential potential. And so that, that will never come to dominate. So it's either going to be subdominant, and it has to be subdominant if you don't want it to affect nuclear synthesis, 
or if you're going to make it dominant and then your standard model doesn't work because um, you don't get um, the the standard model cosmology. So this uh, with this inverse Palo thing, it's an attractor solution and it's a really interesting attractor solution. It's always subdominant when there's some other component, but it wants to behave in such a way that it wants to come to dominate that component. So it changes its follow as a function of scale factor. And so it always wants to dominate whatever um, the dominant component is. So in the radiation dominated epoch, it wants to dominate over radiation, the matter dominated epoch, it wants to dominate over matter. And it can be subdominant um, at early times and not affect nucleosynthesis. So I have one more question. I mean, uh, in your estimations from the Hubble constant, I can see that two point something up two point. Yeah. Uh, in the local, I mean, whenever we uh, consider the uh, collaboration, we are estimating eighty equal to seventy two point something. Yeah. So if we consider the, I mean, material utilization from one sigma to uh, plus one sigma to three sigma. sigma so we can see that uh, whenever we are considering the 60 point something plus minus 2.4. Yeah. So they are going to the local measurements. I mean, I mean, compared. The intention is also indicated from the estimations. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 